Recently, the Palm Springs Kiwanis Club had another great speaker. Let's listen in. Now, I have two questions to ask you. Um, the first one is, is anyone here, does anyone here remember World War II? Okay, one, two, three, four. I've got four people, okay, I, and Larry. I would love to talk to each one of you individually because the only way I can put together a presentation is to steal your information and use what you have to tell me about World War II. And, and I'll end this with telling you about someone that I asked riding in the car, what do you remember about World War II? And I got some of the best stuff. Um, I'm representing the Air Museum. How many people have never been to the Palm Springs Air Museum? Never been? I'm never. afraid of flying. You've never been to the Palm Springs Air Museum? Two of you, okay. Oh, we're taking Anissa and Dennis. Well, we are, <laughs> we are open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. There are four hangars and all of our 60 planes do not fit in the four hangars. And chances are, if you can't come the same day that I'm there, that Larry Roloff will also be there. Uh, early on, when I first got to the Air Museum uh, one time, I scolded Larry for not greeting me when he came in. And so, to this day, the first one of us that says, Hi, Larry. Hi, Dale. That's what, that's what we do when we go in. We, we be sure that we greet each other first. There isn't anyone else of the four. The place is run by a crew of, of paid staff, some part-time, of, of about 12 to 16 individuals and uh, close to 400 volunteers. Wow. Um, becoming a volunteer, becoming a docent at the Palm Springs Air Museum requires that you join, become a member. You buy your uniform. You pass a um, um, a personality a check, you know, with the FBI that you're a safe person. And you take 26 hours of classroom training, do a dissertation, seven stints of on-the-job training. Every docent you run into there is highly trained. Now, many of them are also <clears throat> veterans. Not so many World War II veterans anymore but we have a lot of veterans around, and our newest hangar is the Korea, Vietnam, and Cold War hangar, and we do have more veterans from, uh, from those more recent wars. Well, my speech is about the home front during World War II. We were coming out of the Depression. Everybody had a really hard time, and and things were bleak all over. We also had something called a Dust Bowl in the Midwest. Very few people had cars. Only the people who were, you know, upper middle class and wealthy people had a family car, not an individual car, a family car. Electricity had not gotten to all parts of the country. Many rural people did not have electricity. Um, I know a man who's, who wired his own home in 1952 after the lines came through on the road in front of his house. He thought the Aladdin lamp was the greatest invention because the kerosene lamps only gave you a small patch of light and a kerosene lamp lit the whole room. Not very well, not to our standards today, but it was really a great invention. And visiting my cousins, they had updated things. Their plumbing was updated. Instead of going out to the well and hauling in buckets of water, they had a pump, a little pump, right there on the, next to the kitchen sink. You know, the kids today don't remember dial telephones. Well, they didn't have them either. We didn't know about dial telephones. We didn't have interstate highways. Traffic controllers didn't exist. There was so little air traffic, nobody paid attention. And then our factories started producing planes. And they were taking 
40 planes at a time and flying them over to Europe, to England. Well, it occurred to General Curtis <coughs> LeMay that as he was, very few of them were, see, were flying back, but he was flying back. And all these planes coming at you, and you're up here, and the weather socks in, and you don't know where anyone is, and you're really fortunate if you make it. There was a lot, there was a lot of, of damage done. A lot of planes were lost. A lot of pilots were lost. Um, we've heard of friendly fire today, but there were a lot of loss just in accidents because pilots were not all that well trained. At the start of the war, we were only capable of graduating pilot about 300 pilots a year. That was not enough to meet the demand and the needs. But coming out of the Depression, people from the Midwest were flocking to, the, to get jobs in the factories on the coast up in and Washington around Seattle and, and Los Angeles, they were coming by droves because there were jobs with good income. In fact, by 1944, the average pay per week was $54.65 for a man and $31.21 for a woman. I heard about the war starting on the radio. It was it was a big radio. Of course, we listened to Fibber McGee and Molly, and, and uh, we listened to and, um, well, we had Henry Aldridge. We listened to all these programs as a family. We sat around the radio and listened. And a big, big radio with a slant front, waterfall front. That's where I heard about the war starting. But at the time, the world had been at war for a long time. Since, since September of 1939, <clears throat> Japan was trying to take over China and Pacific Island countries, while Germany, Germany was plowing through Europe and Africa. <clears throat> um, the British got to the point before we joined the war effort that there were 10,000 German troops right there on the coast of France waiting to invade Britain. It was imminent that Britain was going to be invaded. The entire MI5, the entire British Secret Service moved to the financial district in downtown Manhattan. And a man who luckily was not tried for treason and executed because we'd all be speaking German. Franklin Roosevelt said, the President of the United States said to the British Secret Service, the head of British Secret Service, I'm your number one spy. <laughs> Couldn't happen today. <clears throat> well, Japan and, and Germany were taking over the world and America was divided. There was an, an American Nazi party and a closely aligned America First party. I don't know how anybody else feels about America First, but it gives me chills because I know that the America First party, when my husband's six-year-old brother was shot in the abdomen um, back in about 1937, and the uh, Cedars of Lamadon, Hospital, which we now know as Cedar of Sinai, was refused to treat a gunshot wound for this six-year-old boy. Well, the America First Party offered to pay the legal fees for the family to sue the hospital because it was Jewish. So <laughs> that's my my memory of that. <clears throat> because it was it was a a gunshot wound and they felt like they shouldn't do it. It, it did make the newspapers, of course. And, and my father-in-law refused to have, uh, have a lawsuit. Travel, we had <clears throat> gas rationing. Um, auto production absolutely came to a halt. 
when the war started, there were about a thousand um, commercial air air um, airdromes or or um, you know uh, airports that were under construction. They the the civilians seemed to know that air travel was a thing of the future and it was it was important but the military really hadn't quite discovered it yet they they were much slower at coming around to that we had rationing and price control trolls each person's book con contained red points for meat butter cheese and oil and blue points for canned goods sugar meat butter coffee tires and gasoline and shoes required coupons. Now, how much gasoline could you get? An A card for gasoline entitled the bearer to three gallons weekly. Only doctors, ministers, and defense workers got those. Everyone else got two gallons per week. Um, my father was a minister, so he got the maximum number of, of uh, gallons of gas. But he was a district superintendent over the state of South Dakota. And three gallons of gas didn't get him very far. So during the war, my dad would hitchhike and ride in, in the cattle car, and he claimed that, that it was so crowded in the cattle car that you could sleep standing up. <laughs> Over 20 million victory gardens were raised in city yards and public spaces, producing one-third of the vegetables needed to feed us in 1943. Then we learned to can. Uh, freezing wasn't a possibility yet. Many people still had their ice delivered for their ice box. <laughs> but, but the world took on canning. And um, I remember that Dad plowed up our yard, our backyard, and we planted 40 tomato plants. And my brother and I would go around the block selling uh, tomatoes to our neighbors. In our out of our little red wagon. You also saved your, your bacon grease in a coffee can. Mm -hmm. And when the coffee can was full, take the coffee can of bacon grease to the butcher shop and sell it to the butcher. It was used for, for the war effort to make uh, uh, bullets and bombs. Our clothing was hard to get. Shoes were hard to get. Nylons disappeared. Nylon was only invented in about 1937. And so it wasn't very common. Uh, stockings were made um, of, of silk. And if you were poor, rayon. And if you lived on the farm, you were probably still wearing stockings made of cotton lisle. <laughs> Horrible stuff. <clears throat> but they couldn't get uh, nylon because it went to making parachutes and the soldiers wore maps of the area where they were going from the parachute. They'd land behind enemy lines. They'd have a map to help them figure out where they were. And that was printed on silk because it didn't take up much space or weight inside their clothes. At the Air Museum, you will find a display of a wedding gown and a ball gown made of parachute fabric. After the parachute had been used, this was a way of having white material to make a dress. And when you go see it, it's in the European hangar, way over in the corner, and you will see the ball gown, and you'll see a picture of the ball gown being displayed this way, with this face showing. And that's, <laughs> that's because I was the one who interviewed um, Peggy Jacoby, whose gown, she was, she was a Red Cross recreation volunteer. And she was, a young girl, she was stationed at Assam, India. Do you know where that was? That's the, termi <coughs> the terminus of the, the hump over the Himalayas that kept China alive with, with uh, 
uh, delivering everything by air. So, so she was stationed there. She went to Calcutta and, and gave this parachute, which one of the servicemen had given her, to a, a, an Indian seamstress. And she made this beautiful gown with a full circle skirt and a very tiny bodice and a, a gold ribbon um, on uh, appliques on the bodice and on the skirt. Quite beautiful. And then someone donated a wedding gown made out of a parachute, but we don't have, it wasn't the person who'd worn the, para, worn the, the wedding gown, so we don't have that much history on that. But interviewing Peggy was, reminds me that if you haven't had your Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress interview, do come in. Do schedule an appointment and come in and have a videotape inter interview of your experience during the war because those are very valuable not only to the Library of Congress, but we keep a copy there. We make a hard copy and you get a free copy of your interview. Now, if you want to give copies to members of your family, to your children, grandchildren, they're ten dollars a piece. And and many, many times when someone have a family has lost their loved one, they come in and get copies because it's their memorial to that person. So do think about coming in and doing a Library of Congress Veterans History Project interview at the Palm Springs Air Museum. I just want to leave you with the thought that we started out a very poor country going into World War II and very many of the things that we can be thankful for now that we have are the result of, of putting our minds and hearts into the war effort. And if we could learn to work patriotically together in the same way today, we would prosper as a result. Thank you. For more, go to KiwanisPalmSprings.org.